we're going to sing calmer music today, okay, than they sang. What was the chainsaw deal or whatever? Anyway, y'all know all about that. But anyway, uh, our first hymn, number 179, Awesome God. Let's all stand. Nehemiah chapter 8. We'll have it on the screens also. Thank you for our youth leaders that took our young folks and uh, took them up to the conference. As you can see, they had a good time, and uh, that's part of what uh, we need to do to encourage these young folks to be faithful uh, to the Lord. So thank you for the, uh, for the adults uh, that braved uh, the conference and went for us. I've been once. All right, Ezra, uh, chapter 8 says, I, I'm sorry, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nehemiah, Nehemiah, <laughs> Nehemiah, I'm just thinking of a flashback to when I have actually went to one of the conferences. And, um, <laughs> Nehemiah, chapter 8 says, now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all could he who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read it from, from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate, from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of the, all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him, and at his right hand was Mathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Urijah, Hilakiah, and Messiah, and at his left hand, Pediah, Mishael, Malachijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mishalem. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then Jeshua, Bani, Shurabah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatel, Hodijah, Massah, Kilata, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portion to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
The Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe, and in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Moses had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And they should announce and proclaim in all the cities in Jerusalem, say, saying, Go out to the mountain, bring olive branches of, olive tr of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards or the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until the day the children of Israel had not done so. And there was a very great gladness also day by day from the first day until the last day he read from the book of the law and they kept the feast seven days and on the eighth day there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. Amen. Amen. Brother Tim. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house and hear your word read to us again this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to be able to come and worship you in spirit and truth. And, Lord, as we look out and things going on in this nation, Lord, we pray for our nation. We know tomorrow is a big vote in the Senate, Lord, about the right to life, the right of life. I pray, Lord, you just convict each senator to vote in their conscience. Lord, Lord, vote what you'd have them to do. Vote the right way, Lord, that they can do what, what that we realize life is valuable upon conception. Now, Lord, I pray for the ones in our prayer list, God, you reach down and touch and heal those. We thank you, Lord, the ones that are doing better. Ask you, Lord, continue blessing upon the ones that are not and one where death is entered in. Lord, we pray that you'd fill that vacancy with your love. Lord, as we go forward in this service today, Lord, I pray we can all leave here this morning and say it's good being in the house of the Lord. I pray, Lord, you'd watch over us, care for us, Lord, your stars, all closer to you, closer to one another. Forgive us we fail thee. Just name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Children, if you'll meet Josh down front for our children. Good morning. How's it going today? Good. Good. You guys excited yeah. to be here this morning? Y'all yeah. know what that is, don't you? The TV. Yeah. TV remote control. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yep. Yeah. Y'all all have one of these? Yeah. Ever used one before? I used yeah. one by yeah. myself. Well, this is ours. This is ours at the house, and this is what I, I like to, uh, certain TV shows I like to watch. One I like to watch, there's a, uh, a sheriff show now on Netflix. It's about a sheriff in Wyoming. I like to watch that in the afternoons or at night. Me and Jennifer watch that together. And, and I kick back and I take my remote control and I turn the TV on. And guess what happens when I press the on button? It comes on. And then I press the Netflix button. And guess what happens when I press the Netflix button? Netflix. Netflix. And then I press, I change. I have to move to the right. I, well, Netflix come on and I have to move it to the right, I think, three spaces. And so I press that button three times and guess what happens? It moves over three spaces. Yeah. And then I click OK to select, what's the name of that show? Longmire. I click OK, and guess what happens? It starts the show. It starts the show. Yeah. And then Jennifer says, you need to turn that down a little bit. And, guess, and so I press the volume button, and guess what happens? It goes down. The volume goes down, just like yeah, yeah. I tell it to, right? Yeah, down. Yeah, when I press a button on this remote control, it does what I say do. I mean, control. Ain't that right? That's why they call it a remote control. Now, let me tell you this. What happened? What would you guys think if I got up one day, sat down to watch a TV show, mm -hmm. and I pressed the power button, turned TV on, and then I went to Longmire, and I clicked OK, and my TV came up and said, I don't feel like watching that show today. Let's watch something else. What, ha what if that happened to you? Wouldn't you be kind of like, uh? And say, no, nope, let's, uh, let's watch the Andy Griffith show instead. And it turned to the Andy Griffith show. I'd be OK with it, so I kind of let it. And then I said, but that's a little bit too loud. And I went to turn the volume down, and it came up and said, you know what, that's, that's too low. I think we ought to turn it up a little bit. The TV turned up instead. Would you still call this a remote controller? Yes. I think then you might call it like a wish stick. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. 
You wish that it turned the volume down, but it might do whatever it wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish we could watch my TV show, but we might have to watch this one over here. Yeah. And you, you never know. It may just turn itself off. And then I could press the power button, and I wish it would come on, but it wouldn't. The Bible says that when we give our hearts to Jesus, that we give control of ourselves to Jesus. Yeah. We give control of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord with all your mind, body, and soul, right? Yeah. We give control over to him. <laughs> and doesn't he give us commandments? Doesn't he give us commandments yeah. to follow? And he tells us to love him with all of our heart. And he gives yeah. us certain, certain yeah. rules to follow. Not to, not to be mean, but to give us rules that help us through life. Yeah. Sometimes we don't follow those rules, do we? Sometimes we get off from those commandments. And then we become a little bit more like wish sticks. Yeah. Right? Kind of? Mm -hmm. A little bit? Mm -hmm. Alright, this is what I want you to keep in mind. Going forward in our Christian lives, let's become more like God's remote controls than his wish sticks. Okay? Yeah. All right? Let God control your life. All right? Because I'm going to tell you something. You can't do anything on your own that's going to turn out better for you than what you let God do. Yeah. I'm glad you got it, buddy. <laughs> I'm glad one person's getting it. All right? <laughs> so listen. Give control of your life to God. All right? He can do amazing things when you give him control. All right? Sometimes on our own, we just kind of flop to this channel or flop to that channel or just kind of do this over here and it doesn't make any sense. But when we give control of our life to God, He knows which buttons to push. He knows how to direct us. Okay? All right. Let's say a prayer. You ready? Okay. I dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that you came to this earth and died on the cross to give us the ability, God, to give our life over to you, Lord. We can give you complete control, God, and we can trust you. Because you know how to work the remote control, Lord. You know which buttons to push. God, please help us not to be like a wish stick, Lord. Don't let us go over here or go over there or do this or do that, Lord, without your direction. Lord, take control of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, ladies first. What would kids do nowadays if you turned the TV on it took four minutes for the bulbs to heat up? And it was black and white, and you got two and a half stations, and you went outside, because we had a rod welded to the pole, and you turned the pole toward Tallahassee to get Channel 6 and turn it that way to get Columbus. Channel 10, you had to worry about it, because you see the light blinking down that door, and you get it overbled everything. What would they do nowadays? Hmm. they get more exercise, run outside, turn the telephone pole, don't they? All right. 438. Jesus says, off to him. Let's all stand.
property too. A little bit of instruction so that you can help. Uh, for our adult class, at least, we will not have a 5 o'clock service with uh, what's going on tonight, so we will not have a 5 o'clock service. Uh, if you heard in Tim's prayer, there is a vote going on uh, tomorrow in the U.S. Senate. If you would like to make your voice heard, if you go to our Facebook page, we have a post there. I think Christy put the post there uh, where you will get a link to get a phone number or email. It's much better a phone number for what I understand, a phone call uh, to your senator. And even though both of our senators are in favor of what, they need to hear our voice because they hear the other side loud and clear. They call often. And uh, so we need to call our senator and express to him Thanks for them voting in the correct way and encourage them to keep voting correctly. This bill says that a child that has reached 20 uh, weeks of age in his mother's womb, his or her uh, mother's, the, the mother's or her always, and but the baby could be a him or her, uh, that uh, that baby uh, feels uh, pain much longer, but at least by then, and no longer can that baby be aborted. And so uh, to me, that's a minimum uh, requirement and so uh, uh, th that's what's going to be voted on tomorrow evening and so we need to let our Georgia senator uh, know exactly how we feel okay okay senate.gov or our Facebook either place will have links to that so all right 32nd chapter sorry 32nd verse of the seventh chapter of John says the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests and officers take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I will go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and to teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come? On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. And some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that Christ come from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but none laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night being one of them, said to them, does your law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. If you've noticed, uh, we've moved now from the book of Luke. Uh, to the book of John. We've been in the book of Luke for some period of time. Uh, we put, picked up an extended uh, period uh, there of Jesus' life that's covered in nowhere but the book of Luke. If you turn back right quick, like now I'll get past this in a minute, but if you turn back to the sixth chapter and the fourth verse, it says, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. The Passover happens in the spring of the year. For us, this coming up the year, or this year, this coming up uh, Easter, it's going to happen on the 1st of April. And so uh, that's the general time of the feast of the Passover uh, every year. And so from about uh, March, April now to the next great feast, the one that we pick up in the 37th verse of this chapter, the Feast of Tabernacles, has been about six months. And so all that we've talked about in the book of Luke from the 12th through the 18th chapter that we've been looking at, is covers that six months period uh, that we've been talking about. 
now we've come out of that, so we come back and pick up our next time reference, time frame uh, that we're talking about. And here we are in the book of, book of John, and we're at the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Jesus uh, had been going through the region of Galilee, which we saw some of that in our past uh, readings of the book of Luke. And uh, uh, he uh, is uh, teaching there. And now it comes up to, to the Feast of Tabernacles. There were three major feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles being one of them, that every Jewish man uh, attended if it was absolutely possible for him to do so. And there's every evidence that Jesus had attended all of those feasts in his adult uh, life. Uh, in, the sixth, uh, in the beginning of this, the, uh, uh, the seventh chapter, his uh, brothers are encouraging him to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, that was his literal brothers. The Bible records he had four brothers, and uh, they uh, were skeptics. They did not believe he was the Messiah, and uh, they were all the time uh, doubting him and, 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 and causing him some problems. As a matter of fact, one time uh, they called him crazy. They said, we better go get Jesus. He's gone crazy. And so... Uh, uh, these brothers now are encouraging Jesus to get up and go where he ought to go to the Feast of the Tabernacles, tabernacles the Feast of Booths, and uh, he tells them, y'all go ahead, I'm not going right now. And they say, what's wrong with you? It's the Feast of Tabernacles, we go. And Jesus said, didn't you hear me? Uh, I'm not going right now. Uh, it's not my time. It's not what God has called for me to do. For he knew that the uh, the hostility uh, that had been uh, brought on him by the Jews, by the matter of fact, by the way, uh, when you um, read in the Bible this term, the Jews, it's talking about the religious leaders. It's not talking about every person in Israel. It's talking about those elite leaders in Judaism. And he says uh, he knew the Jews were there to get him, and his time was soon coming. And so he says, you go, I'll come later. And so now, uh, in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, he showed up uh, in Jerusalem, and he showed up at the meeting. So for us to get a little bit about what's going on out of this, we need to back up just a tad and understand the Feast of Tabernacles. Once you see that, I think the uh, star is going to light up above your head. The exclamation point uh, is going to stand up there, and you'll begin to see some of the uh, cohesion of the Bible uh, that's before us. And so the Feast of the Tabernacles was instituted. It's a seven-day feast. And it is to remember the period of time that the Lord led the children of Israel out of Egypt, 40 years in the wander, wandering, and then finally into the Promised Land. And what they, they uh, did during that 40 years, they lived in tents and booths in the wilderness. And so God would have them stay in a place, and they would stay there sometimes uh, several months, sometimes even several years, and then they would move to another place. And so they'd have to pick up all their belongings, uh, some... Uh, 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 three and a half million, maybe four million folks would have to pick up everything that belonged to them and move several miles, sometimes 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 miles they would move in this process of wandering in the wilderness as a generation of folks passed away. And so they lived in booths and they were provided for. God would provide for them a quail and manna to eat and he would provide for them water to drink. One of the necessities of living in the desert is water. Now you hear a lot in the Bible about water because it is one of the absolute necessities of life and uh, without it you don't stay around planet earth very long. And they were wandering in the wilderness and and for a group of folks between three and a half and four, that's the size of the city of Atlanta. That's, if you've been to Atlanta lately, that's a pretty nice group of folks. And, and to sustain them with water takes more than a trickle. And so when the Bible said that he provided water from the rock, he's not providing a faucet turned on, he's providing a river turned on. And that was what was necessary uh, to take place. And so as they had, had uh, wandered for 40 years and been taking care of God at the end of the 40-year uh, wandering, God instituted this great uh, festival uh, that we are reading about here today. I read about that, by the way, in the book of Nehemiah, the 8th chapter. That's what's going on. The children of Israel uh, had uh, disobeyed God. They had been taken captive and had spent 70 years in captivity. They now had come out of that captivity from Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and all that. They had come out of that, and uh, the, the Scripture reading there is somewhere around uh, 400 and uh, almost 500 years 
uh, 400 years before the birth of Christ, and uh, Nehemiah is reinstituting the law there in Israel, and now these folks are listening to the Word of God. They are understanding the Word of God. The Bible says those that were old enough to hear and understand were there, and the Holy Spirit was opening their ears, and they was hearing, and they was realizing they had been disobedient to God. They had not remembered what God had done for them. And so they, uh, as they did so, uh, the Bible says when they heard the word of God in Nehemiah chapter 8, they said, we better go back and live in some booths. We better take that seven days because as soon as you forget what God has done for you in the past, pretty soon you're going to be trusting you and you're going to be in trouble again. And so they, it broke their hearts. They began to cry. When they heard what God had done for them, they literally began to weep there in Nehemiah, the Bible said. One of the things that they instituted uh, in, in, in remembrance of this, on the seventh day of the feast, the final day, and this is the great day that the Bible talks about here that Jesus stood up. What they did, they stood at the water gate, and they took a pitcher of water, and they poured that pitcher of water out. And they did that symbolically realizing if God had not provided for them life, water, they would have died in the wilderness. And it is a picture of God's salvation. So this had been instituted, and year after year after year at the festival, people would gather, and they'd be a great throng of people there at the end of the festival. During the seven days, people would come and go, and things would happen. Uh, but but uh, on the seventh day of the festival, everybody gathered around, and they would gather around the water gate, this particular gate, and it would be a big thing as the folks would take the big water pot, and they would take the most precious thing to them, and, and that would be water, and even in that day it would be, and they just poured it out as a sacrifice on the ground. So that's the picture I want you to get this morning because that's where Jesus steps into the scene. So here comes Jesus. He comes in the middle of the festival on the third or fourth day, and he begins to teach. And he teaches those folks that he is life. He, that's the message, and he's been telling those folks that he's going to give his life a ransom. He has been preaching that he is going to be the sacrifice. Remember, six months from this great festival is going to be the next Passover. And it is on that Passover he is going to give his life. And he has been telling these folks that. And so as, uh, as that's taking place on the last day of the festival, no doubt, if you read, no doubt he is standing there. The folks know who he is. And he watches, and as the ceremony takes place, and as they pour out the water on the ground, that's when Jesus stands up. I want to tell you, there's some excitement in the air. But there's anticipation. He's been talking about what's going on, and as soon as they pour that water uh, out onto the ground, he says, and the Bible, the, the, the wording here is, he says it with a loud voice. He would have to have said it with a loud voice. More than likely, he stepped up on the platform. And uh, more than likely, as he did, the crowd looked at him. And more than likely, the, the throng of folks there would have been in multiplied thousands of people would have been there. And uh, they would have looked at him because I want to tell you, he, he was that lightning rod figure. Uh, he was that person that, that when he was around, everybody paid attention to. Uh, he, I mean, if you've been in the crowd... And one day uh, you had been born with a withered arm and one day he looked at you and said be made whole and you'd have stretched that arm out and you'd have had a whole arm. I want to tell you, you'd have thought something about him. Or if you'd have been one of those folks that watched it or if you'd have been one of those folks that the widow was bringing her son by and he was a dead boy and they was taking him out to bury him and he looked at that uh, funeral buyer and it's walked by. He reached out as the rabbi and he touched it and he said, my son, wake up. And that little boy had set up on that funeral buyer. I want to tell you, he was the central figure. Folks was looking at him. And so on this day, I mean, the only day more important probably than this day uh, would have been the day of Passover itself. And uh, they stood there. And it's called the day of the great feast. And so as he stood up, he, he looked at those folks and he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I want to tell you, folks, that caused a stir in the crowd. That, that caused folks to, to begin to say, who is this man? Who in his right mind 
would stand up at this place where we are symbolically pouring water out and recognizing that God is our Savior. That's exactly what they were saying. He had saved us from the desert. He had saved us from thirst. He had saved us from dying. He had given us a land. And we're pouring this water out, saying that God is the Savior. And here comes somebody who stands up and says, If you thirst, come to me. I'm the only one that can satisfy your thirst. Do you know what he was saying? Can you guess what he was saying? He was saying exactly what they were pouring out. He said, I am God, your Savior. Now, we English, non-Israelites, don't get that so much. That's the reason I'm telling you. That's the reason I'm belaboring the point. It's for you to grasp that point. Some folks say, when did Jesus ever claim to be God? As a matter of fact, there's a whole group of uh, folks that base their entire belief on the fact that Jesus is not God. And they witness to the fact that there's only one God, Jehovah. And they do so based upon one premise, is that Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, I'll tell you, they need to read their Bible a little closer. Because right here, Jesus is claiming to be God. If he wasn't, what he said meant no sense. And there was nothing to get so upset about. And so he says... If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as Scripture says, what Scripture was he referring to? Old Testament Scripture. There was no New Testament Scripture. Nothing had been written yet. Zero. As a matter of fact, what you're reading here, John is recalling from the past. That's the reason he gives you some information here. He says, uh, uh, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. He's giving you uh, some updates, some understanding, because all of these things has happened already. He's writing about them. And so, uh, so here he's saying, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow life, living water. He's saying, just as this water was poured out in symbolic picture that God is your Savior, he says, I am your Savior, and if you will drink from me, you will never thirst again. You will have living water gushing out of your soul. And of course, he gives us the addendum to that, which is what will be given to every believer the moment that you are saved, uh, coming to be a guarantee, a down payment of your life everlasting, will be God himself, the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying, here is the crux of the matter. Here is what all of this is about. Here's why I'm here. Uh, I, I want you to understand, uh, all that has gone before me has been a picture or has been bringing things about so that you will see when I come that I am the one that God has promised. So what happened then? That, what happened then happens every time the gospel message is preached. Now, I just preached the gospel message to you, didn't I? I just told you that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that he's poured himself out so that he could be the living water for our lives. He did so by dying on Calvary's cross and rising again the third day and sending the Holy Spirit to us that we might have salvation. That's the gospel message. Every time you preach the gospel message, one of three things takes place. Every time it's taking place right now, it's taking place anywhere the gospel is being preached, and it always takes place. Decisions are made. And here the Bible says one or three decisions, and they picture them for us. First of all, some folks said, this is the Christ. This is the prophet. These folks believed. You have the opportunity when the gospel is presented to you to believe. And some do. And those that believe, the Bible says... Every person that believes that trusts God is their Savior, the Bible says He promises them they have eternal life. Not that they will have, not that they could have, not that they might have, but to every born-again, blood-washed believer, the Bible says you have eternal life. That's the main question of life. That's the reason that you're here, by the way. So you'll have the opportunity to answer the question, is Jesus the water of life? Number two, we had some folks that were skeptical. And there's always that in every crowd. 
There's some folks that I'm thinking about it. Let me see if I can understand that, okay? Just think with me a minute. I'm trying to understand. Somebody, I'm thinking about this. I'm waiting. Somebody has come, given his life, so that when the decision is made, do I spend eternity in hell, do I spend eternity in heaven, that if I will trust him, just by his dying for me and me trusting him, I can spend eternity in heaven with him forever. Now, what is there to think about? Hey, I think I'll wait and see if I can spend eternity in hell. Is that a good thought? Is that a rational thought? I, I don't think so. That's your options, isn't it? Let, anytime you say you're the skeptic, I'm going to think about it, you're saying, hmm, what do I want? Ice cream or dirt? It's a foolish thought, but folks think that way. Let me think about it. I, won't, I couldn't tell you how many times I've, I've, I've talked with someone about the gospel, talked about them to go into heaven and hell, and I wish I had a dollar. I could pay this building off quickly. A dollar for every person said, Preacher, that sounds good. Let me think about it. Heaven or hell? I'm thinking about it. Which one do I want to spend eternity in? How long is eternity? I know the exact answer to that, by the way. I know exactly how long eternity is. A long time. Forever. Am I willing to bet forever that I'm going to have another chance to accept Jesus as my Savior? Let me think about it. I want to tell you, folks, that's a pretty irrational thought. But folks make it, don't they? So by the way, I made it one time. I didn't accept Jesus the first time he offered himself to me. I thought about it. Most foolish thing I'd ever done in all my life. But I thought about it. I said, hmm, somebody's paid all that I need to pay. You don't have to do anything but believe him. And he's going to give you a home in heaven forever. He's going to build you a house, set you on a street of gold. I think about it. I don't know. What, what else you got, God? Oh, well, I got hell. It's a pretty rough place. Every bad person ever lived is going to be there. You won't ever have to worry, worry about heat. Pretty bad. I'll think about it. And then the third, final person to hear is the person that says, wouldn't believe it anyway and think you foolish for believing it. And I want to tell you, there's folks just like that. They're not going to believe the gospel anyway, any way you put it. And as a matter of fact, they think you're foolish for doing so. Isn't that what the uh, Pharisees and the scribes said? They said when the guards come back and didn't have him in possession, they said, why didn't you bring him back? And they said, <laughs> Wait a minute. You go out there in that crowd and get him. I don't think you'd come out alive. And they said, have you come from Galilee too? Are you crazy? What's the matter with you? Have you lost your mind? Did you see any of us believe? And then the Bible just throws in a nugget. I like them. Don't you love your Bible? He said, Nicodemus was there. Y'all remember who Nicodemus was? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He'd come to Jesus by night, and Nicodemus come to know Jesus as Savior. Yes, there was some Pharisees, but they were intimidated at this point, but they were there. And so Nicodemus speaks up, and they look at him and say, have you lost your mind? Either you believe like us, or you're crazy. And there's plenty of folks like that. They're not going to believe Jesus, no matter what. They accept their faith, one way or the other, and happily march to hell. So here Jesus is. The water of life, the answer to every problem in the world. And so he makes this very common yet fantastic offer that he has made then. <coughs> he's made throughout the centuries, and he's making this morning. Will you believe in me, he says. <clears throat> Can I be your water? Will you accept that me, Jesus, and Jesus alone, is the answer to your eternal problem. <clears throat> now, you may get to live in the problem you have right here, but I'm going to tell you, the problem you're living in right here is not going to last very much longer. 
I promise you. If you're the youngest person in this room, <clears throat> your problem, there's Isabel, right? She's probably about the youngest one. If she lives to be 100 years old, I want to tell you, that's not very long. These years slip on by, don't they, Brother Roy? Pretty quick. They're buying. As we go along, do they seem to slip on by a little faster? They do, don't they? My mom and daddy used to say that, and I didn't understand. Now I understand a little better. You don't have long here, but I want to promise you, you got a long time in eternity. So will you make the decision this morning? I don't have a fancy message. I don't have a difficult message. But I have a message that will impact you for the rest of your life. Which of the three categories will you begin this morning? Hallelujah, brother. I believe. Headed for heaven, not based on me, based on the water of life. I accepted what he poured out. Headed for heaven. Or are you in that group this morning? Preacher, sound pretty good. I'm going to think about it. Mm. Think about it. What more do you need? Think about it. Heaven or hell or heaven forbid there's anyone in this room that would say, couldn't convince me if Jesus walked through the back door with nail-scarred hands. Lord, have mercy on your soul. You were hopeless. Where do you stand? Everybody in this building, nobody, nobody gets out from under this. Where do you stand? Father, speak to our hearts. Help us know the truth. The truth sets us free. Help, under, help us understand that's the choice you offered that day. That's the choice you have been offering, and that's the choice you are offering right now. Anybody that thirsts can come and be satisfied this morning. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we stand and sing our invitation song. Find your place. Number 488, Just As I Am.